In this video, we're going to be restoring a 1940s Walker Turner 900 series drill press. Uh, this drill press is missing some parts, so fortunately, I have an identical or nearly identical model to it over here, and I'm hoping that between the two drill presses, I'll be able to take the best parts off of each one and make one complete drill press. Uh, this drill press right here. First of all, the uh, return spring is broken on it, so the quill does not retract the way it's supposed to. The bearings are shot on it because the, uh, the pulley doesn't turn very freely, and it's also missing a motor mount back here to, uh, to install the motor. So, luckily, this drill press over here has the parts that this one is missing. Um, so I'm gonna cannibalize that, take the parts that I need from it, and uh, hopefully between the two machines, we'll make one machine that, uh, that works good. I also have some accessories uh, for it. These accessories are kind of hard to find and uh, they're expensive to find them when you do. I have a table racing mechanism for it but it's broken. Uh, it's missing a section over here so we'll have to uh, figure out a way to get that uh, working. I also have an original switch for it and I have the uh, slow speed mechanism but the pulley on it is busted. So I'll have to uh, figure out a way to get the pulley working on it. And we also have the belt cover. Uh, additionally, I want to install a light on it. Uh, I happen to have an extra. Uh, this light is made by Delta. It's not a Walker Turner. But of course, Walker Turner was purchased by Delta eventually. But I have this uh, light. It's called a, they call it a retirement light. And I'm hoping to clean this up and utilize it as a, as a light for this. Also, I have a motor, and so this motor, when I got it, was in rough condition, and uh, I already took the motor apart, and I repainted it. I installed a new old stock uh, USA made capacitor on it, as well as a couple new old stock SKF bearings. That was the type that the motor had originally on it. So this motor already is in fantastic running condition. The only thing that I didn't get to do at the time was to insulate the windings because I didn't have any varnish. Um, so all I got to do as far as the motor is concerned is take it apart, insulate the windings, and put it back together, and uh, the motor should be good to go. Also, I'd like to mention that the previous owner of the drill press installed this Andre the Giant sticker on the front of it. And I remember being a kid growing up, and uh, I always loved watching Andre the Giant wrestle. I mean, he was just an amazing guy, and I have a lot of fond memories of uh, watching him wrestle being a kid. So I'm going to figure out a way to incorporate uh, Andre the Giant into the finished drill press, just as a nod, not only to Andre the Giant, but also to the previous owner as well. Not sure exactly how I'm going to do that, but we'll figure out something. So I hope you enjoy following along. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and start disassembling the drill press. My intention is to use this head unit for the project and just take the pieces off the other one. Uh, the main reason why I chose this head unit as opposed to the other one is because I have the spindle cover for it. Uh, this one and the other one are slightly different in the way that the, uh, the pulley is captured inside the uh, housing here. So since this one is complete with the uh, spindle cover, we'll go ahead and use that one. So I'm going to go ahead and spray up these bolts with some liquid wrench and start taking everything apart. Uh, prior to turning on the camera, I probably took about 30 or 40 photos of the drill press because sometimes once you have everything apart, it's easy to forget where something goes, especially if you're coming back to it a few weeks later. So we'll go ahead and get started and uh, hopefully things will go smoothly. Before I get too far with the uh, spindle assembly, I'm going to go ahead and try to remove the chuck. The chuck has a threaded collar, and hopefully, when you move the uh, threaded collar in a uh, counter or in a clockwise direction, it should put pressure on the chuck and force the chuck off the table.
Okay, so now I'm going to start removing the spring. Uh, I don't know if the spring is broken or not. The, the quill was not retracting the way that it's supposed to. So it may be broken, but it may not be broken. So in order to remove it, first thing you got to do is remove this bolt right here. And there's some notches that are cutting the housing. So what you want to do is stick something flat. I'm going to use this uh, hacksaw blade behind here so that when we start removing it, the spring doesn't go popping out of the housing and then it'll fly everywhere and be difficult to put back in there. So what I'm going to do is pull this out just a little bit and hopefully get this spring behind here, get this uh, hacksaw blade behind here. Okay, so that spring wasn't connected by any means. Okay. So that spring wasn't connected at all, which is why the uh, why the quill wasn't going back up. Now this is bent, so it may have been broken at one time, and maybe somebody tried to uh, redo that. We'll take a look at it later. But that explains why the quill was not moving up and down. Okay, now I'm going to uh, go ahead and disassemble the quill. There's a couple set screws on this uh, retaining ring here. And hopefully.
Bring the camera in here. See these these bearings take a little bit of fooling around to remove because there's no space. But these bearings have what's called an extended race. So the inner sleeve of the bearing is longer than a traditional bearing. And uh, if you look inside here, there's no space for the bearing puller to go in because the extended race of the bearing slides right up against the spline that's uh, formed into the pulley. So uh, I'm trying to fool around with it just to create a little gap there so I can get the bearing puller in there to uh, remove these. But uh, it just takes a little bit of fooling around to uh, get those out of there. All right, so what I'm doing now is I'm just uh, pressing the spline out of the pulley so that uh, I'll have a little bit better access to the, uh, to the other bearing. These uh, extended race pulleys are not made anymore, or excuse me, extended race bearings are not made anymore, so uh, you got to preserve the ones you have. I do have some, uh, some extra ones. Okay, so as you can see here, I went ahead and I broke down the second drill press in exactly the same way that I broke down the first one. Um, I, went, I went along and took a look at all the pieces from both drill presses and uh, picked out the better pieces from each one, which I'll be using in the restoration. I have a, a collection of bearings here. Uh, these extended race ones, as I mentioned before, are kind of difficult to find. But between all these bearings that I have here, I should be able to find a couple nice ones to use in the restoration. And uh, what I decided to do with the second drill press was, I think that I'll be able to get the second drill press functioning uh, enough for it to be usable. I won't restore it, but I'll just get it in mechanically sound condition. And uh, in my development here where I live, they have a workshop in the back. And I was in there the other day, and I noticed that they had a cheap Harbor Freight drill press in there. So uh, what I'll do with the second one is I'll get the second one put back together and I'll just donate that one to the uh, workshop in my development here and they'll be able to use it. It'll be a, a, a big step forward from the Harbor Freight one that they have now. So um, next step in the process is going to be uh, doing some paint removal and some de-rusting on these pieces and getting them cleaned up. The other machine, 
uh, I went ahead and reassembled it. Uh, got new bearings in there and everything is greased and working the proper way. And this was the one that I put out in the workshop here in, uh, in my development. So the pieces that I uh, took from this machine to use in our restoration project was number one, the table. Uh, so the original table from this machine is now going to be used in our restoration project. Uh, the spring housing from this machine is now used in our restoration project and also the, uh, the quill and the pinion from this machine was in a, a lot better shape. And lastly, the other thing that I took off this machine was the column. Uh, the primary reason was that the column on this machine was about two inches taller uh, than the other column. Uh, both of the columns had quite a bit of rust and pitting on them, so um, I just took the other one because it was a couple inches taller. Uh, I put a, a Brown and Brockmeyer uh, B-Line motor on the back of this, um, and I was able to rebuild one of the two chucks, uh, which functions great uh, for this drill press here. That's moving real freely, opening and closing the way it should, and uh, this thing's this thing's running real nice. There's Chuck. Let me turn. So, uh, anyways. Uh, I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, it's a big upgrade compared to the Harbor Freight uh, machine that they had out here before. So uh, now we'll focus our efforts on our restoration project. Okay, so I went ahead and I soaked the uh, rusty pieces in some evapo rust overnight. And uh, these pieces came out looking pretty good. Uh, in order to de-rust the column, I used a piece of PVC pipe with a cap on it. Uh, that way I didn't have to use too much evaporust in order to uh, get that part cleaned up. Uh, one thing that I did notice is the chuck is completely, it's completely frozen. It doesn't move. I had this thing uh, soaking in some evaporust for about two days and also in some degreaser uh, in case there was any dried up grease in there. So uh, this thing does not operate at all. And the other one was uh, also in bad condition. The, the jaws on the other one were worn out. Uh, so right now, uh, we do not have a functioning chuck for the drill press. So I have to, uh, I'm gonna try to go ahead and take this one apart and see where it's at. But uh, that's definitely something that's gonna have to be addressed.
I went ahead and I polished up the hardware for the drill press. Uh, this is just the hardware for the drill press itself. It doesn't include the table raising mechanism, the slow speed pulley, or the delta retirement lamp. I'll work on those uh, pieces separately. This is just the hardware for the drill press itself. So as I mentioned earlier, I pulled off some of the pieces from the other machine that were in better condition and swapped them out. So uh, this piece right here, this piece right here, uh, this piece right here, the column, uh, the, these pieces all came off the other machine. And also the uh, the table came off of it. And uh, and I took the little, uh, little badge from it too. Uh, in addition, I had to buy a couple pieces uh, that we didn't have. Since I decided to get both machines functioning, uh, I had to replace a couple pieces because they were missing. So one of the things I had to buy was this motor mount, and uh, it has some two connecting rods that connected to the head unit. Additionally, I also had to buy these two pieces. I did have two chugs and I was able to restore one of them and use it on the other machine that's out there in the uh, garage. But the second chuck was in such bad condition and corroded so badly that I just couldn't uh, salvage it. So as much as I like to reuse uh, as many original pieces as possible during a restoration, uh, the, the most important goal of this machine is that it functions good. I want it to function like brand new and that just wasn't gonna happen with the old chuck so I had to throw that one away and uh, I purchased this one off of eBay, and then I also purchased a, a key for it. And I'm in the process now of ordering a rebuild kit for this. Th this one is like brand new. Uh, the jaws and everything are like brand new, so it does not need to be rebuilt, but I ordered a rebuild kit just to have it uh, on the shelf in case it ever does need to be rebuilt. I'll have one on standby. Over here, I'm working on uh, stripping off the paint on some of the castings and uh, as I mentioned in a couple of my other videos recently I've been using this product called purple power it seems to be the best product for the cheapest price available today since they changed the regulations on paint strippers uh, to remove paint so what I do is I just fill up a plastic bucket like this there's the uh, the head unit is in there right now soaking and uh, leave it in there overnight when you pull it out doesn't have any paint on it or if it does have paint on it it scrubs off real easily the only pieces that I won't use the purple power on is this uh, belt guard is made out of cast aluminum so I'm, I don't know I think this purple power is gonna be too strong to use on uh, cast aluminum same thing with the uh, zinc pulleys I won't use those uh, in this but for the cast iron pieces works like a charm so this I'll just have to hit it with the uh, wire wheel clean those up so uh, the next step is going to be to finish getting the paint removed off the rest of these castings and then uh, start cleaning the castings themselves up before we can uh, begin the process of getting things ready for paint. Okay, so now I'm at the part where uh, I'm starting to clean up the table. And uh, in order to do that, I'm going to try to do uh, most of this work by hand. Uh, one thing that I don't want to do is I don't want to ruin the beautiful uh, machining marks that are still on the table. Uh, considering the age of it, it's, it's actually in pretty good shape. There's one little hole here that uh, we can plug up and just a couple little tiny divots, but nothing major. Um, but it has all these nice machining marks. And uh, so what you don't want to do is go in there with some kind of a machine and, and uh, coarse grit sandpaper or something like that and you'll sand all that away. So what I'm going to be doing is uh, I cleaned off the heavy rust just using a little penetrating oil and the scotch Bright pad. And now what I'm going to do is I have some 320 grit, some uh, 440 grit, and I have some uh, 4 out uh, steel wool. And I'm just going to go ahead and use the uh, liquid wrench penetrating oil or some WD-40 or something along those lines as a lubricant. And uh, I'm going to just try to uh, pretty this up just a little bit. Uh, the most important thing is that it's functional, which, it, which uh, it's fine just the way it is. But uh, we'll try to shine it up just a little bit more. And then... Uh, I'll get in here and just clean up these edges a little bit on here where the, it's a rough casting and uh, I'll just use the Dremel tool for that and just clean up those edges a little bit and uh, I'll plug up that hole and uh, should be uh, ready to paint it pretty soon.
so now I'm getting ready to uh, clear coat the pieces and uh, I'll be using that uh, 2k clear product again uh, I was real happy with it uh, when I used it on the Emerson fan so uh, I'll be using it again here and uh, once again this product is a uh, two-part uh, clear coat so you need to wear protective equipment when you uh, spray it so I'll be wearing the respirator uh, for this part Okay, so this is the table raising mechanism, all broken down to its components. Everything's been cleaned up, and I was able to uh, recover this missing piece and get that repaired. Uh, that repair happened off camera. I took it over to my buddy to get it fixed. So now that that's all cleaned up, go ahead and put it back together. Okay, so this is the setup that I'm going to use to try to press apart the slow speed pulley. Now, to be honest, I'm a little bit nervous about trying to get this thing apart because uh, I've read some horror stories that uh, there's a couple different configurations of these internally and one of them just has a couple bearings in there um, which come out real easy, but the other one has bearings that are integral to the uh, shaft and uh, person who tried to take that one apart ended up having to cut it into some pieces so I'm hoping we don't have to do that so we're gonna try to press this out and we'll see how it goes okay so pressing out the bearings was not an option because there's an internal snap ring uh, inside this pulley that prevents you from doing that. So what I've done now is I took a die grinder and I ground down this outer lip and then I used a uh, pin punch and I went ahead and punched out the first bearing here uh, which you can see it's, it's out about a third of the way and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the bearing off of there and that will allow me access to the internal snap ring. I'll remove that and then we'll be able to get the other bearing out of there. Okay, so you can see that the uh, slow speed pulley, I've got that apart. And the way that that was together was there is a retaining ring that's inside the pulley and that's why I couldn't uh, press those bearings out. The other issue is that these bearings are integral to this shaft. So once these bearings wear out, they cannot be replaced. Uh, it's basically disposable at that point. This, uh, this pulley here has a hairline crack which somebody previously tried to uh, repair with some JB weld. I have a few step pulleys, and the closest step pulley that I thought might have worked was this one because it already has a, an inch wide opening inside of it. Um, the trouble is, is that all the step pulleys that I have are just a little bit taller than this one, and consequently they don't have the clearance to fit underneath the, uh, the bracket that holds it in place. So, um, other than completely uh, fabricating a new um, motor mount, I'm gonna have to try to repair this one. So what I'm gonna try to do is uh, 
I'm going to try to use a product which I've never used before called Muggy Weld. And uh, this is like a, uh, a brazing slash uh, solder material that melts at a lower temperature than the pot metal. And um, so I'm going to grind out the hairline crack that's in there and see if I could repair it with this, uh, with this Muggy Weld. So it'll be the first time using that product and we'll see how it goes. Okay, so what I've done now is I'm taking this little uh, cold chisel here and also this uh, X-Acto knife with a chisel type blade and I'm carefully breaking out all the JB weld that's in the uh, pulley there and you can see where the where the split is that's going to need to be repaired. So uh, once I got the, the bulk of it out, I'll take the uh, Dremel tool with a wire wheel and clean up the rest of it and then uh, we'll start preparing that for the brazing. Okay, so what I'm doing now is I'm using the vise as a kind of like a press and I'm trying to straighten out the uh, the loops of the pulleys here. All of these were, uh, were all bent up and out of shape so you got to be real careful anytime you're working with this pop metal material because it only bends once and uh, if you bend it back and forth it will definitely break. So I'm being very very careful just trying to uh, gently persuade these things uh, to a uh, straight position and I'm also using a ball peen hammer and a little punch and just getting in there and just trying to straighten out each one of the little shelves so that uh, it's straight as possible. Okay, so here is the finished repair. So after we grooved out the crack, filled that all in with the brazing material, and uh, we won't know how it holds up until uh, we get some pressure on it, but uh, the product seemed to work as it was advertised. Uh, it just takes a little bit of getting used to with the uh, getting the flux up to the right temperature, and once you get a feel for it, then it flows in a little bit uh, better. So. Ultimately, we'll see how it holds up once we get a load on it. So uh, at this point I'm working on getting the head unit put back together. Uh, I've got all the bearings greased up. I picked out the best bearings from the collection that I had and I'm using this uh, red grease to grease them before I install them. <clears throat> you can oil the bearings. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's an oiler on here and that's how it was designed originally. You could dribble some oil in here and it would just kind of splash around in there and oil those bearings. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and just grease them and every once in a while just pull it apart and put a little bit of new grease in there. So uh, we'll put this together and see how it goes. At this point I'm not putting a belt on there. Um, for this particular model, putting a belt on there is pretty easy. You could just pull off this uh, spindle cover and slip a belt in around there. So we'll do that at the end.
Okay, so these are the pieces that make up the Delta retirement lamp. And uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and take these pieces and uh, finish puffing everything out. And then uh, we're gonna install a new cord on there. And that should be good to go. Pretty easy project on uh, refurbishing that. Okay, and here we have the retirement lamp uh, cleaned up, it's got the new cord on it, and it's ready to be installed. I have the machine pretty much put back together and the muggy weld brazing job that we did on the uh, slow speed pulley seems to be holding up okay. Uh, what I did was I used a slightly narrower belt than this machine would normally use. It would normally use what's called a 3L. V belts are uh, sized by 2L, 3L, 4L, 5L and the higher the number means a wider belt. I think what caused that uh, slow speed pulley to break originally was the person who had a belt on there, had like a 5L belt on there, and it just put too much pressure on that flange and it finally just snapped off. So what I decided to do was use a 2L belt, which is uh, a little bit narrower. It would have had a 3L on there before, but the reason why I did that is because it doesn't put so much pressure on that flange. And this just being a bench model drill press, these belts are way more strong than it'll ever use, so it's not like it's a milling machine or something like that. And uh, it seems to be holding up uh, very well, the muggy weld, so uh, we'll have to see how it does over time. The other thing that I changed was I changed the handle on the table raising mechanism to a hand wheel. Uh, the original handle that was on there was the long one, and what would happen is that would just touch the bottom of the base, and uh, in order to clear the base, I had to raise the whole mechanism up. And because this is a bench model, every inch of working room that you have is important. So by putting this hand wheel on there, I was able to move the mechanism all the way to the bottom position and therefore I maximized the amount of working room that I have on the table. And when I crank this, you can see that it works really nice. And then I lower it. And that works like a charm. Uh, the other thing that I did was this column really had a lot of pitting and it had a lot of uh, dents in there from where people tightened the set screws too tight on there. So what I did with the column was I just left it kind of a brush finish as opposed to uh, polishing it out to a more mirror type finish because the more you have something polished out, the more you can see all those little uh, pitting defects and things like that. So by leaving it kind of like this brush finish, you don't really notice as many of the defects in there. And I got the chuck installed and uh, that seems to be working good. So uh, we're ready to give it a test run. Okay, so I have the machine set up on its slowest setting. Uh, I just want to do a little demo to show that the muggy weld repair is holding up. So we're just going to drill through this uh, little piece of wood. It should really be spinning faster for that, but we're just testing out the uh, brazing job that we did. So let's give it a whirl. <laughs> So now the machine is finished and I'm really happy with the way that it came out. Once it made the necessary repairs to the table raising mechanism and the slow speed pulley, uh, that was the biggest part of the battle I, in my opinion. So uh, these Walker Turner machines are really good quality and uh, a drill press is probably one of the most important machines you could have in any workshop. So I'm real happy to add this to my collection. And I was able to source an identical uh, Andre the Giant sticker to what was on there originally. 
That sticker was made in 1989 by an artist named Shepard Ferry. And I think that whenever possible, it's nice to keep a little memento to the previous owners on the uh, machines. And hopefully one day when I'm gone, somebody would extend me that same privilege. I'm not sure exactly how much runout is in this machine, but it's very, very minimal. I'll have to pull out the indicator and take a look at it. But it's definitely uh, really a tight running machine. So I hope that you enjoyed following along in this project. And I look forward to the next video. Thank you for watching.